Welcome, welcome to the mysterious book emporium. Finally back in Val Rayo, our heroes are about to meet with the divine. But will she see reason regarding the cure to tranquility? Or more importantly, will the Lord seek her? Why don't you take a seat as we finish off Asunder, chapter 16 through the epilogue. Chapter 16. Reese remembers the last divine, Beatrix III. When he had met her, she was an ancient woman, so senile she forgot where she was and fell asleep during his audience. But as him and the others gather in the Grand Cathedral to meet Divine Justinia V, he is surprised to see how proud and capable she seems. She is followed by only a few attendants, including Liliana. Lord Seeker Lambert starts with talking with the Divine, saying that this whole thing is unneeded and he can take care of the matters, but she dismisses him. Looking over the crowd, the Divine recognizes Evangeline as the woman who saved her life only a few short weeks ago. She brings the Templar up and praises her, not only for her rescue, but for the report she gave on the events at Andamant. She goes on to say that Evangeline should be rewarded for her actions, saying that she should lead the Templars at the White Spire when the Lord Seeker returns to his regular duties. The Divine asks Wynne to step up then, but Faramond breaks down crying in fear, yelling that he was only doing what he was ordered. The Lord Seeker is outraged by this, demanding to know why the Chantry would look for a weakness in the right to tranquility. The Divine shoots back that mages are the Maker's children and should be cherished, not tolerated. Reese is shocked to hear her words and notices that Adrian is crying as well. Wing goes on to explain what happened to Faramond and that he can no longer control his emotions. Faramond explains his research, saying that he was able to find a way to reverse the rite, but not take away magical abilities without making one tranquil. The Lord Seeker is outraged, claiming that all this has done is make the mages have a hope that those who are tranquil will become mages once again. And then Adrian shouts out that maybe they should be, that it would be kinder to kill mages rather than turn them into mindless servants. Her and the Lord Seeker argue a bit before Reese steps in. He appeals to the Divine, who recognizes him as Wynne's son, saying that Faramond's research is still useful, as although he might not have found a way, someone still could. Lord Seeker yells out again that they must keep quiet what was found, but Wynne says that it's already too late. All the circles were notified when they sent word ahead via the Sending Stone. The Divine then decides to let the mages meet again, another conclave held in the White Spire rather than Cumberland, in one month's time. The mages will debate a new policy of tranquility that they can agree on. The Lord Seeker agrees, but on three conditions. One, that the conclave is restricted in size, only allowing the first enchanters and those present currently. The Divine agrees. Two, that Reese, Wind, Faramon, and Adrian are imprisoned. The Divine orders all but Wind to be confined to their rooms, refusing to let them go to the dungeons. And three, Faramon must be made tranquil again. And the Divine agrees. Faramon breaks down in tears after hearing the order, and the meeting is closed. The Divine leaves as Wynne holds the Elden Man, trying to keep him calm. Chapter 17 Three weeks have gone by. While Evangeline was currently Knight Captain, it was in name only, as her main duty was guarding the empty dungeons. While other Templars would visit her, giving her advice on how to win back the Lord Seeker's favor, Evangeline didn't care. This wasn't the Templar order she joined. She tried several times to get an audience with the Lord Seeker, but he ignores her. What is worse is that she wasn't able to talk to Reese about... Well, Evangeline pulls out a note from her pocket. His name is Cole. He's not that old. Perhaps 20 years, no more. He has blonde hair that hangs in front of his eyes and wears dirty leathers. Perhaps the only clothes he owns. He was there when you found Reese in the Templar crypt, but you couldn't see him. Nobody can. And those who do forget him just like you are doing right now. Remember the dream. She remembers now, although more the dream in the Fade than Cole, whose face she cannot place. But she must remember. It's her duty to. Suddenly the Lord Seeker walks in, surprising Evangeline. He asks her to speak more in her report, namely about the lack of murders and of Cole. Lord Seeker Lambert is convinced that he is a blood mage, but Evangeline disagrees. Finally, he makes her an offer. He will see Cole, and promise not to harm him, and Reese will go free as well, if she stands before the Conclave and denounces Faramond's work. Evangeline refuses, asking why they can't deal with the mages with compassion, and the Lord Seeker answers. I come from the Deventer Imperium. For ten years I serve with the Imperial Chantry. Did you know that? No, I'm not surprised. I left because the Circle of Magi had been corrupted beyond hope of redemption. The Magisters slowly took back power within the Circle inch by inch. 
After all, what harm could there be in allowing the mages to govern themselves? Who better to know what mages need and how to teach them to resist the lure of demons? Those are excellent questions, she said. I agree. At the time, I believe the answer was yes, that the mages were best served when trained by their own. He noticed Evangeline's incredulous look and almost smiled. I did not begin to my service convinced that they could not be trusted. How many of us do? He goes on to say his trusted friend became the Black Divine, but he has turned to Forbidden Arts to get his position. When he confronted his friend about it, the Black Divine called him naive. Evangeline is uncomfortable. While she preferred to think of the Lord Seeker as an unreasonable man, it's true that behind every unreasonable Templar is a good reason to be one. The Lord Seeker leaves, saying that she will not be staying at this tower, and that he will hunt down Cole. And Evangeline thinks on how she is happy that she is a disappointment to him. Reese has been trapped in his room for three weeks. He worries about Evangeline, about Cole. The only person he doesn't have to worry about is Wynn. Like on cue, there is a knock on Reese's door. It's Wynn bringing him food. She makes small talk with Reese, telling him news about the Civil War in Orlay, that the first enchanters are pouring in from all over Thetis, that she isn't fond of Fiona, as it was her election to the position of Grand Enchanter that caused the College of Enchanters to be shut down when she called for a sudden call to separate from the Chantry. Reese and Wynne talk about what will happen during the Conclave. Reese asks if she has given up her plan to fix the circle, and Wynne laughs. She hasn't. She explains that what happened at the meeting with the Divine was mostly a play for the Lord's Seeker, and that things largely went according to plan. But Wynne admits that she is worried about Faramond, who is in agony in the wait to become tranquil again, which has been scheduled for the night before the Conclave. Reese thinks on how the last three weeks have been, that him and Wynne used to fight all the time, but things have cooled off. He then asks why she found him all those years ago after the Blight. I wanted to see what my son had become without any guidance from me. That is true, but I thought I was dying. The war in Ferelden was over, and I believe the spirit could not keep me alive for long. I had to see you. At least once. Then why didn't you come back? She looked at him, her eyes moist. Reaching out, she cupped his cheek. It was a gentle, affectionate gesture. Because you were fine. You were lovely. What could I do except cause you damage? Damage? But what use would you have for an old woman, Reese? You live your entire life without me, and here I was, an abomination and a crusader to save the circle. You joined libertarians, and I was content to let you find your own path. So that's it. He shook his head, moving her hand away from her face. You thought you were dying, and when you didn't, the only reason you came back was because you thought you could use me? Wynne shook her head, horrified. No, you don't understand, Reese. I... A knock interrupts them. It's Adrian. She is surprised to see them there, saying that she wanted to talk to both of them, but Wynne leaves anyway. Reese is a bit annoyed that his talk with his mother was stopped short, but he hears Adrian out. She wants him to convince Wynne to vote for Mage Independence. Reese doesn't like the idea. He knows that he could guilt her into doing it. He has the ability. But he's not going to use his mother. Rhys started to formulate an apology when Adrian leaned in and kissed him. He was taken completely by surprise and grabbed her by the shoulders to push her back, perhaps more forcefully than he intended. What, what are you doing? I don't want to lose you. She was crying. Now that the tears were coming, they came forcefully. Her entire face twisted in grief. All those years, I told myself it would be better to be your friend. I soon we would be together, and that together we could do anything, but... I feel you drifting away from me, Adrian. He tried to console her, but she turned away from him, embarrassed by her tears. Adrian, this isn't the way to keep us together, isn't it? She looked at him, her eyes red and pleading. Don't you love me? Reese can't answer, just like he couldn't answer back when they were together. In the silence, she gets her answer. And getting up, she says it doesn't matter anymore. Reese replies that he is willing to help in other ways, but Adrian just tells him that he can't even help himself. And she leaves. Chapter 18. Cole knows that something big is happening, but isn't exactly sure what. Out of all that came out of the journey to Adamant, perhaps the most unexpected is that Cole has become braver. He doesn't avoid the Templars anymore. He walks right up to them, stares in their eyes, all because he knows they can't see him, and they don't. Cole knows that Reese and Evangeline can't help him, nor can Wynne and Adrian, but he might be able to help them. All he needed to do was stop hiding. Cole lurks in the tower, waiting to visit Faramond. While he knows that he can't be seen, his actions can. He remembers the discussion about him during the trip, that what he can do is a power, not a curse, something that he is doing, so he tries to control it. 
He concentrates, making the guards not notice when he takes their keys and they jingle or the door opening. The darkness inside wells up. He had summoned to use its abilities and it tries to overpower him now, but he wills it back. He was real. He won't fade away. Cole enters Faramon's door, noticing that the first snowfall of the season piles up on the barred windows. Faramon is surprised and scared to see Cole, but most shockingly is that suddenly Faramon remembers and recognizes him. He asks if something has changed and Cole responds that he can see him because he wants to die. Faramon doesn't deny it, afraid of being made tranquil again. Cole tells Faramon that he came to free him, to get him to safety. Faramon thinks for a moment, standing up to look out the window, and finally tells Cole of his time at Adamant. He says that the winters were always horrible at Adamant, that no matter how long or how much they prepared for the winter, someone always died from the cold. But they always celebrated the first snow's fall, something he found strange. Cole is unsure why he's being told this. Faramon looks at him and tells him that there won't be celebrations in Adamant tonight, and that he doesn't want to escape. He wants Cole to kill him. Reese stands in the meeting room of the White Spire, waiting for the Conclave to start. Out of the 19 first enchanters, 15 are able to make it, plus the Grand Enchanter Reese, Adrian, and Wynn. Templars watch over them, along with Evangeline. Reese stands off to the side while Adrian has been fixated on Grand Enchanter Fiona. All of them have been waiting for Faramon to complete the rite so that they may begin, but he has yet to show. Evangeline walks up to Reese, asking why he is apart from the others. He quips back that his allure of being the alleged murderer was too much, so he was ordered to stay back so that the ladies would not faint, and she laughs. The two talk of Faramon, surprised that not even Evangeline knows what is keeping him, although she is not in favor with the Templars. Reese apologizes for getting her in trouble, and she replies that it's not his fault. She wanted to help Cole. Reese is surprised that she remembers him. Well, that she tried to, at least. He finds her effort touching. The two sit there in comfortable silence for a while before Reese speaks up. I have to tell you something, he finally said. I admire you, Evangeline. Of all the things I've ever thought Templars were like, you've managed to prove me wrong about every single one. If more of them were like you, she was actually blushing, though she hid it well under a casual air. The Order is a place where ideals are set aside for the sake of necessity. There simply isn't room for compassion or mercy, and those who feel there should be, she hesitated and then shrugged. They find themselves on the outside, as an example to the others. Just like the rest of us? Seems that way, he grinned. Somehow that makes you more attractive than ever. Evangeline looked at him incredulously, perhaps wondering if he was serious. He was tempted to laugh it off, pretend it was a bit of teasing and nothing more, but he just couldn't. He held her gaze and something passed between them, something neither was willing to acknowledge, but it was there nevertheless. Suddenly, Fiona speaks up, yelling that they are no longer waiting. She announces that this is the first time that they have met in a year, and she will not waste it. She puts forth a vote to separate from the Chantry again. We are to discuss Faramon's research, Wynne insisted. Nothing more. If you derail this conclave, Fiona, we'll never get another. Fiona snorted diversively. This isn't a conclave. This is a joke. We could discuss what to do about the Riot Tranquility until we are blue in the face. Do you believe the Templars would even think about following our advice? The Divine is willing to fuck the Divine. The Enchanters begin to argue about if they should even be talking about this, and Evangeline notices that Templars are leaving their watch to report what they are seeing. She interjects that whatever they plan to do, they better do it fast. Reese speaks up, saying that the Lord Seeker will find this vote treason no matter what is decided. It's them to decide if they should trust the Divine or stand. A crash outside is heard, along with the sound of Templars approaching. Fiona tries to quickly push the vote, but it's too late. Lord Seeker enters, calling out that he is ending the Conclave. Fiona steps ahead of the others protectively, arguing with him. He announces that the reason they've been taking so long is that Faramond has been murdered, and a bloody knife has been found in Reese's room. When the Lord Seeker holds up the murder weapon, Reese doesn't recognize the blade. Cole didn't murder Faramond. Evangeline calls out that Reese isn't the murderer. She told him who was. But the Lord Seeker doesn't believe her. That while Cole might be responsible, Reese is being controlled and killed Faramond and the others. Wynne pulls back Reese from the Templars, and the Lord Seeker motions for his men to attack. A fight breaks out. At first, it's just a scuffle, but then a Templar accidentally kills a first enchanter who yells that she surrenders. Wynne tries to heal the enchanter, but it's too late. But Reese pulls her up and drags her out of the meeting room. Eventually, he meets them and they run out together, but the Lord Seeker cuts them off. Reese summons a large magical attack, yelling for Evangeline and Wynne to run for their lives. And they do. 
Reese holds the Templars long enough for the two of them to get away, but he is tackled and beaten. As he blacks out on the floor, he thinks that at least he did something right, letting Evangeline and Wynne run free. Chapter 19 Evangeline and Wynne trudge through knee-deep sewer water. There is evidence that people used to live down here, but it seems that the poor and homeless in Valrio have all been recruited into the army. Evangeline had to drag Wynne away from Reese, and she understands. She's worried about what has happened to him, too. It's now evening, meaning the two had spent the entire day running away. Evangeline calls out to Wynne, asking where they are going, and Wynne points to a safe embedded into the wall of the sewer. Wynne explains that Liliana always told her to be prepared, and she listened for once. She rented the safe from a man in the Thieves' Guild. Opening it, she takes out a red metal staff, which she explains was given to her by the hero of Ferelden. Evangeline can already sense an evil power coming from it. Wynne tells Evangeline that she is going back to the tower and she will either find her son alive or the man who killed him. Wynne asks about Evangeline what she will do now that her future with the Templars is over. Evangeline replies that one of her old duties was to track down smuggling rings that were selling lyrium, and that perhaps she could find them once again for a supply? It might be difficult, but it's a start. Suddenly, Evangeline notices a boy coming towards them. It's Cole. She doesn't recognize him at first, but Wynne does. Cole is relieved to know that they remember him, and Evangeline hugs him, glad he is safe. But Wynne calls out to stay away from him. He has murdered Faramon and ruined the Conclave. Cole denies this, and Evangeline backs him up. The knife that was held up was not Cole's. Wynne doesn't care and calls for Evangeline to step back. When she doesn't, Wynne still begins to cast dangerous magic, shooting it at Cole. He manages to dodge it, and Evangeline reaches Wynne, knocking her back and taking the staff, and smashes it on the ground. Wynne screams, angry that her weapon was destroyed. She begins to cast another spell towards Evangeline, but she is stopped, a knife to her throat. Cole telling her that he won't let her hurt Evangeline. The heat of the moment dissolves. Wynne asks if Cole didn't kill Faramont, who did? Evangeline believes that it was the Lord Seeker. The two women begin to worry that Reese is dead, and Cole says that he isn't. Cole tells them that everything that happened to Reese is his fault, and he wants to help his friend. Wynne apologizes for her actions towards Cole. He tells them that there is a way into the White Spire from the sewers, and he knows the way. They are going to save Reese. Reese's body shakes with agony. He is alone in a dark cell. He thought he remembered that Cole had come to visit, but his mind is so foggy. He wonders what happened to the rest of the mages, but his cell opens. It's the Lord Seeker. He tells Reese that the other mages in the Conclave who are alive, along with a few others, are in the dungeons. Reese asks what he is doing here, and the Lord Seeker replies that he wants a confession. And then Reese says he didn't kill Faramont, nor did Cole. Or if he did, it wasn't with the dagger that he found. Lord Seeker asks Reese what he thinks Cole is. Reese says that he is a lost young mage with strange abilities, but the Lord Seeker begins to build a case that Cole is not human. Reese, a spirit medium, is the only one who is able to see Cole, and that he first saw Cole when he was seeking him out. Lord Seeker pulls out a book, which Reese recognizes is his own research. Demons often become confused when they pass through the veil, he read. They find themselves in a world they have no control over and no connection to. They seek out such connections, possessing whatever they can see and touch, and seek to make it conform to the world they have left behind. A world embodied by concepts and emotions rather than immutable reality. They subsume themselves in the world of the living, and this is what drives them mad. He goes on to say that he believes Cole is a demon, using Reese to kill others in blood magic rituals to keep Cole in this world. Reese denies this, but he goes on to say that he looked in the records for a boy named Cole, and none exist. The story that Reese knows is false. If Cole can make people forget things, couldn't he make Reese forget that he kills people too? Reese begins to doubt his own memories, and then the Lord Seeker pins Reese by the throat, yelling that he needs to confess. And if he doesn't, Reese, along with the other enchanters and Adrian, will be killed. Reese begins to laugh, and the Lord Seeker stares at him in fury. The mage tells him that he almost believed him about Cole for a second, but he will not confess. Maybe a confession would save the others, but is it worth it to give a false proof to the lie the Templars have created? He doesn't think so. So the Lord Seeker leaves, and Reese prays to the Maker that no one will try to save him and to help Cole. Chapter 20 Shale, Wynne, and Evangeline sneak up into the White Spire. Wynne worries that perhaps they should have stayed with Cole and Liliana, as who is going to be able to heal Reese? But Evangeline tells her that he will be fine, they'll have their parts to play. The trio pass many levels without seeing a soul until they come to the level where the mages are kept and find the common room packed with Templars. There's no way up without being seen. Wynne calls forth the small spirit. Wynne asks it to help and then it splits apart, spreading out into all of the doors in the level. A moment goes by and then it creates loud popping sounds, like small explosions from each door. 
The Templars race towards them, barging into doors to see what is going on and giving the trio enough time to slip past them. As they leave, Evangeline hopes that what they have done doesn't harm any of the other mages who are sleeping. They easily pass through another level, but when they turn a corner, are suddenly face to face with an elven woman, a tranquil. Do you know who I am? Evangeline asked. I do not, Captain, the tranquil answered. You have been declared an enemy of the Circle by Lord Seeker Lambert. Are you going to warn the tower we're here? She hesitated. Do you intend to harm anyone? Only if they harm us first. The elf nodded slowly, as if this answer was acceptable. The Lord Seeker was delivered an urgent summons to the Grand Cathedral, and left with many Templars. He declared he would not be gone long. Whatever it is you plan, I suggest you be quick. Evangeline exchanged a glance with Wynne. It appeared Liliana had been successful in convincing the Divine to aid them after all. That explained the emptiness of the tower. Why are you telling us this? She asked. I've never known the Tranquil to do anything but what they were told. The woman tilted her head curiously, as if the answer should be obvious. Obedience is prudent. To interpret it as a lack of free will would be an error. She turned to leave and then paused. Good luck, Night Captain. They continue on, finally reaching the phylactery chamber. A lone Templar, a young man who just entered this order, stands guard and is horrified to find them. Evangeline tells the young man that his duty isn't to defend the chamber, but to call for help. She tells him that he should not fight them, but should rather rush down the stairs and call for others, and they will let him pass. The boy is surprised and makes a move to leave. When no one attacks him, he rushes down the stairs yelling for help. When and Evangeline open the vault door together, all the mages' phylacteries line pillars in the room creating an eerie red glow. Shale walks inside and begins to smash the nearest pillar, eventually caving in the whole room. Evangeline and Wynne are worried that Shale didn't survive, but it walks out, noting how satisfying that was. Cole and Liliana stay hidden near the dungeons. After what seems like forever, loud sounds can be heard from overhead, and the Templars keeping their watch jump up, unsure of what to do. Most leave their posts to see what is going on above, but three remain. Liliana comments that it's more that she would like, as it would only take one to seal the dungeons. But Cole tells her that he will take care of it. He walks over to the three other Templars and kills them, using his power to make them not notice when one of the others have dropped dead. Cole can feel the dark power in every inch of him now, and he forces himself not to vomit. The two find the keys and open the first cell they find. Inside is Adrian, sporting a black eye. She is shocked that someone has come to save them, and they begin to let the others out. But Cole is only focused on finding Reese. Liliana can help the others. Cole was only here for his friend. Chapter 21 Reese feels himself being dragged up, hearing Cole's voice begging him to wake up. Cole helps him walk to exit his cell. Reese notices that something about Cole has changed, but can't quite put his finger on it. The Lord Seeker's words come back to him, but after a moment of thinking, he knows Cole is real, so he continues on. Adrian spots them now, asking if Reese is okay. When he asks if she is okay, she is surprised. And that's when Reese knows that his friendship with her is truly gone. Together, the now-freed mages rush down into the pit to the White Spire and into the sewers, but Cole and Reese fall behind, as Reese is too weak to walk on his own. But then, they hear Templars coming. Reese is panicked as there is nowhere to hide, but Cole tells them that everything is alright. The Templars come close to them, and they talk of hearing footsteps, but don't see anyone. And then they leave. At that moment, Reese notices the blanket of magic that surrounds them and kept them from being noticed. Cole made him invisible to the Templars. Cole crumples to the ground, whimpering in fear and his nose bleeding. Reese is disturbed by his new magic, but they continue on to the sewers. Finally, Reese tells Cole that he has to stop. The pain from his injuries is just too much, and they pause somewhere in the sewers. But the two hear someone coming towards them. Cole hides them once again, and out pops Lord Seeker Lambert. He yells out that Reese shouldn't have destroyed the phylactery chamber, as he held on to his all along, and knows Reese is nearby. When Cole and Reese don't move, he takes out a small book reading aloud a spell in ancient Tavine. And suddenly, Cull gasps as the magic around them shatters. Cull charges at Lambert and the two begin to fight. Lambert is able to knock Cull's dagger into the water and stabs Cull in the shoulder. Not knowing what else to do, Cull leaps onto the Seeker, screaming, clawing, and biting at him until Lambert pulls him off and throws him aside. Reese calls out for Cull to run as he searches the water for his dagger, too weak to cast spells. Lambert is able to pin Cull down, punching his face until his nose breaks. Reese manages to find Cole's dagger and attempt to stab Lambert, but the Seeker manages to knock the weapon from Reese's hands. So desperate to have your prey, demon, it would be wiser for you to flee into the Fade and never return. Cole spat out dark blood. I'm not... not a demon. Of course you are! The Lord Seeker looked around and spotted where he's tossed the small book. He picked it up and showed it to Cole. The Litany of Adrala. Do you know what that is? Cole glared at him and said nothing. Of course not. 
the man continued. It was created by a magister of Deventer to dispel demonic influences over the mind. It works on nothing else. Reese's heart sank. He watched as the anger drained out of Cole. He stared at the Seeker in confusion. Poor, stupid spirit, the Lord Seeker said. He put the book away and walked towards Cole. The young man tried to retreat, but he couldn't stop staring, his mouth agape. Did you try so hard to pretend you were one of us? Pretend you were real, that you forgot what you really were? Reese yells that Lambert is wrong. Not all spirits are the same. Not all mages are the same. Not everyone who is possessed is abomination, and he is able to summon some magic. But when he locks eyes with Cole, he realizes that the boy is crying. There is no anger in Cole's face, only realization. His world had just crashed around him. He wasn't real. And then Cole fades away, seeing that Reese's strength finally gives out. Lambert mocks Reese, but they hear more people rushing towards them. Evangeline gets there first and begins to duel with the Lord Seeker. Reese calls out to Evangeline what had happened, but she had heard it. And for her, it changes nothing. Just before the others can arrive, Lambert is able to make a final blow on Evangeline, killing her. She's able to mouth I'm sorry to Reese before she goes. When the other mages find them, Lambert knows he is outnumbered. He calls to them that they will be hunted and all will be put back in their cages, and he runs away. The others follow him, but Wynne stays behind. Reese crawls through the water and holds Evangeline's body, wiping the wet hair from her face. Reese is overcome with grief. He has lost Cole. He has lost Evangeline. All he wanted to do was save them, but instead, he lost them all. Wynne brushes Reese's hair with her hand, and when he looks up, her eyes are filled with tears. He is suddenly reminded of the woman he met all those years ago, his mother. Let me, she whispered. But you can't, she's... Shh. Wynne put her hand over his lips to quiet him. Then she cupped his cheek lovingly, yet there was sadness and regret in her eyes. I never knew why the spirit kept me alive, when I should have died all those years ago. Now I do. Wynne turned her attention to Evangeline. She played both her hands on the body and closed her eyes. There was a rush of power. Reese didn't know quite how to describe it. It expanded out of wind, filling the sewer tunnel with its warm light, and he watched in amazement as something flowed out of her and into Evangeline. It wasn't dark or terrible. It was life. It was a spark. She meets Evangeline's eyes, and he knows it's her. She's alive, but he knows what wind meant now. And when he looks towards her, she gives him one last smile, one that says goodbye, and then she falls back and is gone. Chapter 22 Reese looks out from Anderal's Reach, a ruin of a Tevinter fortress on the outskirts of Orlais. This is where the mages have taken refuge for the last month. Ever since, mages from all over have been coming in, carrying news of other circles. The mages are rising up. But if mages from miles away know of this place, it's likely the Templars do too. It's only a matter of time until they are attacked. Civil War in Orlais has only been getting worse as well, and the Templars might have to deal with that, but whatever happens, let them come. Reese hears Adrian approach. First Enchanter Edmund didn't survive the fight of the White Spire, and now she has been voted to become the new First Enchanter, even though their circle is gone. She tells Reese that they are calling for him and that the new Conclave will start soon. Reese has left the Libertarian Fraternity, a move that deeply offended Adrian. Due to his mother, he was now leading the Aquitarians, a place offered to him by First Enchanter Irving. She asks him how he will vote in their move to separate from the Chantry, but he doesn't say. She turns to leave, but he catches her shoulder and asks how Faramond died. Lambert denied doing it, and there was no reason for him to lie to Reese, and he knows Cole didn't do it either. I think there's another answer, he growled. They faced off in tense silence. She stubbornly refused to budge or answer him. Then, slowly, she lowered her eyes. Fine, she said. Her voice was so quiet and laced with guilt, he knew the answer even before she said it. I killed Faramond and placed the knife under your bed. Tell me why. Why do you think? Adrian said angrily. It was the only way Wynne was going to change her mind. She went to that conference to talk everyone out of voting for independence again, and she would have succeeded. She looked up at him, her eyes challenging. She wouldn't ever have stood up to the Templars, not unless she had a reason to, not unless someone she loved was threatened by them. Reese felt his rage boiling over. He tells her that the blood of his mother, Evangeline, and all the others are on her hands, but she says that Faramond wanted to die. He begged Adrian to kill him, and she was proud to do it. Reese is disgusted with her, and he tells her that whatever they had is through. All of the mages stand in the ruins, snow falling down around them as the conclave starts. Fiona stands on a fallen column. 
It's calling for a vote to separate from the Chantry. As the circles have fallen, the mages have agreed to vote by their fraternities, and it'll be weighted based on their size. The loyalists stand first, calling to submit to the Chantry and beg for forgiveness. A few smaller fraternities copy that logic. Adrian then stands up as a representative for the Libertarians. They vote to fight. There's no turning back now. Going to the Chantry for and asking for forgiveness will only make their situation worse. Now the Aquitarians have to vote. The choice is split, and it seems that whatever the way they vote will be the decision. Evangeline gently squeezes Reese's hand before he makes his speech. You all know who my mother was, he said to the crowd, and she taught me something before she died. It was that the time has come for us to put aside our assumptions of the past, the assumptions of others as well as our assumptions about ourselves. We know nothing of tranquility or of demons or even our own limitations. Whatever comes next, we will only survive if we learn to look upon it with new eyes. If we don't, we will simply make those old mistakes over again. And whatever our fate, we will deserve it. Some nodded at his words, but no one spoke. Grand Enchanter Fiona waited and then looked at him with a perplexed expression. Forgive me, Enchanter Reese, she said, but I do not believe you made your vote clear. Reese took a deep breath and then cast the final die. I vote that we fight. Reese stands in the snow, glad that it's over, but unsure of what the future holds. Evangeline comes to him, asking what he is thinking of. He replies that he is thinking of Wynne and how she saved Evangeline. She explains all that she saw was blackness and a beautiful golden light brought her back. She doesn't feel any different, but she isn't sure if the spirit is inside her. Together they agree that they don't think they'll see Cole ever again. Reese then asks what Evangeline plans to do, and she tells him that she plans to fight by his side, and they will face the future together. They kiss, Reese thinking on how natural and right it feels. She takes his hand after and asks him to follow her. Not far from Andorel's reach is a massive oak tree, beautiful and very old. And beneath it, they buried Wynne's ashes. A suggestion from Liliana. Wynne wouldn't want a large monument or a fancy crypt, just something simple. Friends of Wynne gather around the tree. Liliana, Shale, Irving, all mourning a woman who tried her best to leave the world in a better place than she found it. Liliana then begins to sing an elven melody, one of loss and how all things must end. To Reese, it was one of the most haunting and beautiful melodies he had ever heard. Epilogue Lord Seeker Lambert walks into his chambers, a small elven page walking behind him. He tells the boy to take down a letter and begins to speak. Most holy. The Seekers are well aware of the part you played in the rebellion. You call me to the Grand Cathedral in the middle of the night on urgent business only to speak of trivial matters? And then, when I return to the White Spire, I discover chaos, and one of your agents in the midst of the apostates. Did you think I would not notice? Did you believe yourself above repercussions for such acts? It was a dark day when the Chantry placed such an incapable woman upon the Sunburst throne. I will not stand idle and watch you destroy what ages of tradition and righteousness have built. In the twentieth year of the Divine Age, the Navarran Accord was signed. The Seekers of Truth lowered our banner and agreed to serve the Chantry's right hand, and together we created the Circle of Magi. With the Circle no more, I hereby declare the Accord null and void. Neither the Seekers of Truth nor the Templar Order recognize Chantry authority, and instead we will perform the Maker's work as it was meant to be done as we see fit. Signed this day on the 40th year of the Dragon Age, Lord Seeker Lambert Van Reeves. The boy finishes it and rushes off to have it delivered to the Divine. In three days, he would march on Andoril's reach and crush the mages. He was going to be the hero this world needs and save them from the mages. He would sleep well tonight. He removes his armor and tucks himself into bed, but as he begins to fall asleep, he notices a noise and sees a young man with shaggy blonde hair. The young man leaned close, his expression one of deadly intent. There was a call, he whispered. You forgot him in that cell, and I heard his cries when no one else would. I went to him and held his hand in the darkness until it was over. When the Templars found him, they erased everything to hide their shame, and I was helpless to act. Sorrow, and perhaps even regret, crossed the young man's face, but only for a moment. I'm not helpless any longer. The words sent a chill through Lambert's heart. What do you want from me? The young man smiled coldly. I want you to look into my eyes. Discussion. Before we start, remember last time when I mentioned that weird double paragraph? Well, Flukas sent me the audiobook recording of that last line, and it's actually different, so I wanted to let you hear that. They stood there, stunned, as the dwarf urged his horses onward. A civil war, then? 
But there had been no mustering of the Chevalier, no calls to arms under the imperial banner. What had happened while they were in the Badlands? It was ill news of the worst sort. So it just skips the second repeated part, but still, the more you know. Reese's description of the Divine is interesting, at least compared to what we know of Beatrix III. If you watch The Dawn of the Seeker, the Divine in that movie is Beatrix III. She doesn't look that old, although granted no one really did in that movie, but there's only about a 10 year difference between that movie and when Reese meets her later, so she went down pretty fast in those 10 years. I skimmed past it pretty fast, but along with the cure for tranquility, something the Divine wanted Faramond to look for was a way to take away magical abilities without taking away a person's emotions. While Faramond doesn't believe a way could be found, that doesn't mean we won't see a way in the future. And a bit on that note, we actually never see Faramond cast any magic at all. Despite having him emotionally all over the place, he never actually has any wild magic spells, or even seems to cast anything on purpose. Maybe it was just overlooked, as you would think that he was not able to cast magic, it would be noted, but it's a huge missed opportunity to see how dangerous reversing tranquility can be. Anana says, The divine ordering to tranquil Fairmont again is cruel. Could she not order something different? And yeah, she probably could have. I, I think there's an argument that he was overly emotional and could be possessed again, but like I mentioned, we don't really see any threat towards that, and if they were really worried about that, then they wouldn't have waited three weeks to make him tranquil. So I think the real reason why she ordered him to be tranquil was to appease the Lord Seeker. Fairmont was used as a pawn in her game, which I am both forgiving and judgmental of, I don't know, it, it, it makes it all the worse when the Order doesn't even bring about the ends the Divine was looking for. I, either way, yeah, it's it's pretty shitty. <laughs> we learn that both Evangeline and Adrian have forgotten about Cole, but while Adrian remembers nothing, Evangeline wrote down what she knows of Cole and really tries to remember it. Wynne, on the other hand, remembers just fine and seems to have been able to see him the whole time, similar to Reese. We don't get a great explanation as to why she never mentions him before, but the best we have is that Cole didn't fit into her plans, so she doesn't care. So I think from this, we can guess that the reason Reese was able to see Cole was that he is a spirit medium, a trait that he did get from his mother. We also get a lot of names of first enchanters from all over Thetis, including Irving, who has seemed to survive the events of Dragon Age O in Bioware Canon. So I could list all of the names in the book, but honestly, a lot of them are said to have died, but they don't actually list who, so at this point we don't know who has survived until the end of the novel, minus Irving, who is there at the end. Something small to note is that we finally get confirmation of Big Nose's name. Big Nose is Arnod, the Lord Seeker's favorite to take over what Evangeline's job was to be. It's not really that important, but good to know that everyone is on the same page for this guy being a giant asshole. Before anyone asks, yes, Grand Enchanter Fiona is the same Fiona from The Calling. After she was cured from the taint, she was moved back into the Circle of Magi and would be made Grand Enchanter about a year before Sunder begins. In this book, she's described as being just as short and fiery, perhaps even more so as she was in The Calling. The only difference is that she is graying just a bit. From Flukas, I find it strange how the Templars have abused Chantry rules for so long and were just allowed to get away with it. In Dragon Age Origins, Irving made it clear that the first enchanter had the right to have mages come and go to and from the circle as they please. Anders made it clear that Meredith was breaking Chantry law in Kirkwall, and finally Lambert. It says he wants to keep law and order and strives for non-corruption following the rules by breaking the rules he says matter so much. All signs of tyrants. It's okay to break the rules because they alone have the correct way of doing things. And yeah. I agree, but sadly the Chantry can't really do much about it as the Templars are their only forces. You can actually learn later that Lambert's plans went a lot deeper than what we saw in the book. He had planned to overthrow the current Divine as well. Really, he's not that much better than those friends that he got angry at in Deventer. Out of all the chapters in this book, and maybe even like all of the books we've read so far, I think chapter 19 is easily the weakest, or at least the first half of it. To start, the whole evil staff seems so out of place to me and doesn't seem to serve a purpose other than to show that Wynn will do anything for Reese, which we get a good example of later when she gives her life to save Evangeline. And then the problem of Evangeline not having enough lyrium is suddenly fixed when we learn that she knows people who sell it illegally. Why wasn't that brought up before? What makes that a possibility now and not when Reese asked her to run away with him? It just seems a bit sloppy to me, really. Like, honestly, you could cut out that whole section and it'd be fine. 
Like, th that whole section is completely unnecessary to the rest of the book. The confrontation between Reese and Lord Seeker talking about Call is interesting, in that both men are sort of correct. Lord Seeker is right in that Call is a spirit, but Reese is also right in that Call is just lost and his memories are indeed real. Call is somehow both. We get more of what Call is in Dragon's Inquisition, so I'll leave that for there for the most part. We learn that Cole and Liliana have met before, and as we see in Inquisition, she doesn't end up remembering him. Liliana's hand in rescuing Reese might be why he seems to have a soft spot for her in the game, always wanting to help her get over the death of Justinia V. There has been a lot of unusual magic in the Dragon Age, and what Wynne did by bringing Evangeline back to life is supposed to be impossible. Yes, this does technically happen to Wynne as well in Dragon Age Origins, but we don't actually see it. It was possible that Wynne was close to death but was healed by the spirit. But Evangeline was dead. She was gone. If you didn't think this spirit was powerful before, this act proves that it can do things that is thought impossible in the world of magic. Which brings us to ask the question I have been putting off, what is this mysterious spirit of faith? We aren't sure why it picked Wynne. We aren't sure what it plans, if anything. For a spirit has been unusually quiet. It says nothing. It communicates nothing. All it does is watch and heal. All other spirits we have met, including the mysterious spirit of the divine, are willing to talk. Really, that's all demons want to do sometimes. But not this one. This one just likes to watch. It might be that all spirits of faith are like this, but what if it isn't? It's very possible that this spirit is more than just your average spirit. If it is currently inside Evangeline, it's letting her take the reins as it did with Wynne. It seems content to just keep both women alive to do what they wanted to do with their lives. And here's a crackpot theory with absolutely no proof at all. I get theories after theories about how so many people and legends in the world of Thetis are the maker. I've never really bought into them for various reasons, but if one day it comes out that this strange and powerful and very quiet spirit is the maker, I think that would be very fitting. Maybe that will be a theory video for another day, but for the moment, it's something I'm wondering. This whole novel, for me at least, has been Adrian constantly getting worse and worse and worse in my book, and she finally seals the deal with what she did with Fairmont and framing Reese. I can sympathize killing Fairmont. It is what he wanted. Even if it isn't the right thing to do, both Adrian and Fairmont believe that being tranquil is worse than death, so I think it's an understandable action. What I think is unforgivable, though, is blaming Reese, putting him at risk to put forth her cause. And if there is one thing we have learned about her over this whole novel, it's that she has this nasty habit of punishing Reese when he does something she doesn't like. And I wouldn't be surprised that part of the framing was based on him not saying that he loves her. Granted, we have no proof of that, but it's not out of character either. Adrian has become what Anders did at the end of Dragon Age 2, except she has no excuse of a demon. She just got her head so far up her ass, she can't see when she's running over people needlessly. During the impromptu funeral for Wynne, Liliana sings another elven song. From its description, it sounds just like the one sung by Liliana in Dragon Age Origins. Hopefully this time, it's a lot less awkward. So, after this book ends, what happens next? It's left on quite the cliffhanger, and a fair amount is actually touched upon in Inquisition. So let's start with Cole. Obviously Cole is a companion in Inquisition, and I won't go into his time in the Inquisition, but after killing Lambert, he stays with the Templars watching over them and what they will do. And this is where you meet him in DAI. And something I've put off until now is how different book Cole and game Cole are. It is a bit hard to judge Cole from most of the book, as he does change from the start to the end, but there are still some noticeable differences. For one, his powers seem to be different. Cole was able to pick up on some feelings of people, but never to the amount in Inquisition. A large part of Cole's abilities in the book revolve around the mysterious dark power inside of him, but it's never brought up in Inquisition. As Anna pointed out, Cole smiles as he kills Lambert, and that kind of seems out of character for him. He hasn't been shown to be glad at killing anybody. Inquisition Cole also seems much more interested in other people than Book Cole. Book Call really only seemed interested in a few people, and everyone else is just kind of there. He doesn't even bother using their names even after he learns them. In the end, this could all be explained away by that moment when Cole fades away. He suddenly knows himself more, and the changes we see are more like the spirit of compassion than Cole. As Flukas puts it, basically he's a new person. He's essentially grown up and gotten more mature and caring, rather than being controlled by simple thoughts and drives and instincts. He's growing up and becoming himself. All this started in Asunder, took place between the novel and game, and continued in Inquisition. That's why he is different in canon. 
Anyway, moving on, Lambert is obviously dead, but his death is largely a mystery. Cassandra comments to the widely accepted theory is that it was a killing from the mages. Lucius Corrin would replace him as Lord Seeker, and that didn't work out too well, as you see in Inquisition. Now, at the end of the novel, Lambert mentions that they will march towards the mages soon, but that doesn't end up happening. There isn't a reason given for this, but I'm presuming that the chaos from Lambert's death puts a pause on his plans long enough for the Divine to create the Conclave at the Temple of Sacred Ashes. Which, speaking of that, Reese is invited to the Temple of Sacred Ashes, but Evangeline convinces him not to go. It seems that Evangeline got word that the Templars were being corrupted by Red Lyrium, although not by that name, just by something, and didn't think it would be safe. She wouldn't have known how dangerous Red Lyrium is, or even what it was, but she knew enough that she didn't have faith in the Conclave. But in a letter to the Inquisitor, she seems to deny knowing this beforehand. I don't know if this is just a continuity error or what, but that's, that's a thing that happens. Anyway, Reese and Evangeline have stayed together, and if you recruit Cole, you can unlock a war table mission about them. You find that they have been captured by Red Templars, and the Inquisitor can help free them. Once you do, they offer their help to the Inquisition, which what that looks like depends on what the Inquisitor chooses, but either way, Reese will send a letter referencing Cole. Reese doesn't know that Cole is with the Inquisition, but Cole knows that Reese still thinks of him as a friend, and that he remembers. As for the others, like Shale and Adrian, we aren't really sure what happens. There is an argument that Adrian could have been at the Temple of Sacred Ashes, but if Fiona wasn't there, I would honestly be kind of shocked if Adrian was, but at the moment, we don't really know. Finally, Pathogen7 says, This might be a dumb question, but do you have any ideas what the title Asunder actually means in the context of the novel? I tried looking and I can't recall anywhere they mention this word anywhere in the novel. They actually do use the word asunder, but not in a way that gave you an aha moment of why the book was called as such. So I, I have no official answers, but this is my guess. The word asunder just means to divide and break apart. And the whole book has to do with things breaking apart. Adrian and Reese's friendship, the right of tranquility, Evangeline's faith in the Templars, Cole's knowledge of who he is, the nation of Orlay, the mages and the Templars. The book ends up with so many things being broken, really the only thing that kind of gets fixed is Reese's relationship with his mother and Evangeline. Everything else is asundered. The novel. So, the cover art. This is one of those covers that doesn't really make sense until you read the book. The scary looking man on the cover is Lord Seeker Lambert, and flipping over to the other side, you can see Cole and his dagger sneaking up behind. This might be set in the confrontation between the two of them in the sewers, but I, to me it just seems more like a vague picture of the two characters we know. Overall, I think it's a wonderfully drawn cover, although I do wish there was a bit more color to it, but oh well. The book itself was released on December 20th, 2011, about three years before Inquisition would come out and only nine months after Dragon Age 2 came out. Amazon rates it as 4.6 out of 5 stars, which makes this the highest rated Dragon Age book currently. It is also the only book to not have any one-star reviews, so fun facts on that. As for my personal ranking, I do really like this book, but I would personally place it as my second among my favorite books at the moment. I, I might move it up later, but I do have some problems with it. My major concern is that the start is really slow, taking quite a while to set up its pace, and when the actual action starts, it is just all slammed together. That being said, I don't think it drags. If anything, I think the pacing at the front of the book is okay, but it just rushes too much at the end. You can just see it happening with the chapters too. I sectioned off these videos by about 100 page per video, and this last section had eight different chapters, and a lot happens in each of them. But it was really only like a, like a little over 100 pages. I, I think in my version it's about 117 is what I counted. Like it's, 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 it's a lot happening in 117 pages. That aside, I love Wynn so much, and this book made me fall in love with her son too, and Evangeline. Adrian go to hell though. I it was really touching to see the interactions of Wynne and her son, and seeing Reese has inherited his parenting instincts from Wynne. He really treats Cole as a son, and Evangeline seems to adopt him as well towards the end of the novel. Really, the two kind of got together by seeing how devoted the other was to helping what they believed to be a helpless young man. And with that, thank you to everyone who submitted entries. I look forward to what everyone comes up with next time. If you have any comments, artwork, or anything else, please send it in. Next, we'll move on to The Masked Empire by Patrick Weeks with chapters 1 through 5. So please send me your comments, artworks, videos, literally anything by November 11th, 2018. This does give you an extra week, but with the holidays coming up, the, this timing is going to make more sense later on, I promise. 
Anyway, either comment below, send me an email at guildathon at gmail.com, tweet at guildathon on Twitter, or PM user Gillanon on Reddit. Duress Sherall. <laughs>